Hey everybody, I'm Boletsky. Before we begin, if you aren't familiar with my rating system, you should watch the explanation linked in the video description. Remember that anything stated in this video is ultimately my own opinion, and these first impressions reviews are made in the context of Gaining Grounds 1, with everything that we know about that meta, so some options usefulness can change with the introduction of Gaining Grounds 2. Also, my channel is small and won't be releasing videos daily, so you're unlikely to see them unless you hit those YouTube buttons you always hear about. It costs you nothing and lets you know when my content comes out, and it gives me that dopamine hit I need to keep working on the series. So please subscribe, like the video, and write something to me in the comments. It really means a lot. With that out of the way, let's start the keyword review featuring Seeker. Playstyle Prediction Seeker is a keyword focused on healing effects and strong combat models who can win through attrition. Jedza maintains a 6-inch zone of control around her, which slowly drains enemies of life and prevents friendly Seeker models from dying, at least for a little while. She holds down an area or engages the enemy directly with an entourage, each member of which spawns a different effect when one of the others heals. Some crew members can break from the pack to complete objectives and are able to return to prolong their life if necessary. Seeker is incredibly strong in a fair fight, ending lives to fuel their own while leveraging strengths that prevent fighting back effectively, but they're more vulnerable and less capable when forced to chase enemies far away from their master. With proper play, Seeker will claim victory often, maybe even without a single casualty. Keyword Features Every Seeker model has unimpeded. This is simple, but very strong. Forests litter some boards, enemy crews could drop terrain markers, and for normal models, Severe might as well be impassable considering the way it wastes AP to traverse. Chronicle does something different for every Seeker model, which we'll go over in their card reviews, but it always triggers the same way, when another model within 6 heals. Remember this doesn't work when the model itself heals, but multiple Chronicle effects can activate from a single model healing. Also, unless this is FAQ'd, you actually need to lose health and then heal it back in order for the Chronicle to trigger. You can't just heal at full health. Hazardous terrain, 2-inch engagement ranges, auras, pulses, and small movement effects. Seeker crews combine these features extremely well to disrupt and damage the enemy. Small push or move effects on enemies can be used to trigger hazardous terrain, place enemies at the edge of 2-inch engagement ranges, or clump them together for pulses and blasts. The idea is to push the enemy into a position where disengaging or walking is a better option than attacking, either because they can't target you, because they'll suffer hazardous terrain damage if they do, or because a nasty attack will hit them next activation if they don't spread out. As we review each model, keep this in mind when I mention small push effects. The Bubble of Life This is a combination of several Jedza abilities, all with an aura of 6 inches. To make my commentary easy to follow and avoid naming individual abilities again and again, I'll be referring to these effects together as the Bubble of Life or just the Bubble. Fragility of Life and Chronicle Wanderer make it so that when a Seeker model is killed, Jedza can heal it for two by spending a life token and reduce the next damage instance it takes to zero this activation. At worst, you can consider every life token as Jedza stapling two additional health and a modified hard to kill onto the resurrected model's card. The Chronicle effect adds to this, probably keeping the model alive until Seeker gets to activate and do something about the situation. Completely changing the dynamic of survivability in this way causes a lot of headache for the opponent. Models which could normally be killed will instead continue to influence the board with engagement ranges, Chronicle effects, and auras. It also makes Seeker amazing at schemes where you have to keep a friendly model alive, like Claim Jump or Vendetta. Life tokens can only be spent on Seeker models, but Jedza's Chronicle activates on any model. This makes healing during enemy activations immensely powerful in Seeker. I believe the only Explorer's models which can do this practically are Jedza, Winston Finnegan, and the Intrepid Effigy or Emissary. Jedza starts with two life tokens, and will usually get a few more from Sophie. She gets one every time a model dies within the bubble, too. In some games, Jedza will be conserving her few tokens like they're made of gold, and in others she'll be making it rain and still have tokens left over after the fact. The second part of the Bubble of Life consists of draining enemy health while healing friendly models with Font of the Everlasting and Inevitability of Death. This will occasionally ping enemies and may allow Seeker to leave them at one health to die on their own. It also makes enemy healing nearly impossible near Jedza. It's technically possible for the opponent to use multiple instances of healing, or to use an area of effect heal, but that won't come up often. 
With life token usage, hard to kill, and just through normal gameplay, Jedza will often have allies with 4 or less health in the bubble. An extra point of healing is never unwelcome, and will trigger chronicle effects. In particular, Jedza's chronicle can then negate one instance of self-damage or an ability like Black Blood. Note that all of the effects that make up the Bubble of Life are auras and require line of sight. Proper positioning will be critical once crews hit melee combat. Master and Totem Jedza, 15 cost Master Jedza is difficult to label with many of the common archetypes like Blaster, Beater, or Summoner. So I guess Healing, Support, Pulse Damage Master is the best we can get. We've already gone over the Bubble of Life, so you can imagine that her survival is critical. Luckily she comes with Hard to Wound, 13 Wounds, an Insane Willpower 8, and a good enough Defense 5. This survivability comes close to Titania's, making Jedza pretty safe to play aggressively with. Drain Life also reminds me of Titania's ranged attack slightly. It's not nearly as good, but can be similarly used to heal while attacking. The mask trigger will usually be a small push effect on the enemy. It's a simple attack, and at least nice to have. Life of the Earth is much more complex, and much more dangerous for the enemy. On average, most models will have less than a 50% chance to pass the simple duel, which only gets worse if they're staggered. Here's a rundown of the most common terrain you'll be using this on. Buildings, large rocks, and ice pillar markers deal 3 damage. Forests give staggered and distracted plus 1. Areas of fog and lamp markers give just distracted plus one. And lastly, geode markers deal one hazardous damage followed by three damage, and the order is important for things like hard to kill. Targeting a whole terrain piece can create some absolutely massive pulses when targeting things like forests, houses, or rocks. Be sure to define terrain very clearly so arguments don't happen mid-game. If you get to select deployment zones, consider where the opposing crew might be forced to clump near a terrain piece. Also, remember that blocking isn't the same as impassable. Most boards are littered with random barrels and boxes that are blocking and climbable, but these don't do anything for life of the earth. A weary road is a great bonus action. No duel required, just free movement and a free ski marker. Jedza will use this on herself fairly often, since she doesn't want to waste AP walking with her pitiful 4 move, even if that's bumped to 5 near Sophie. Lost knowledge will be likely used at least once per turn. It's possibly the best action in the game for removing enemy scheme and terrain markers, although only one at a time. Usually Jedza will be happy removing her own marker just to draw cards and apply an irresistible staggered before using Life of the Earth. The crow can either be cheated or occasionally you can use a soulstone for it. Lastly, Plenty of Wares is a 1-2-3 heal that only requires a 4. Generally using a valuable master AP for a small heal isn't great, so you'll want to use this action more cleverly or with triggers. The bubble turns this into a once per activation irresistible attack which deals straight flips on damage. Using the ram trigger for 2-3-4 damage or tome to remove enemy focus is particularly good. The crow trigger is probably the best one since it grants a full move. On enemies, the TM-15 willpower is fairly hard to resist and forces them to move instead. All in all, Jedza's area of influence is slightly limited, but her impact within that area is immense. She can charge forward to trade damage and farm life tokens off enemies, or play further back in an area control style. Definitely don't go too aggressive and charge her to her death though. The best way to use her is dependent on what situation she's in, but generally it's a good bet to go for one lost knowledge with the crow trigger, followed by one life of the earth on the most impactful terrain piece she can target. Sophie. 4 cost Enforcer Totem Sophie is a somewhat durable support totem on a massive base. Passable defenses and 6 wounds with hard to wound is pretty good for a support totem, but Sophie will be damaging herself, so in practice her health is more like 4 or 5. Using life tokens on Sophie depends on how good her abilities are in the current matchup. Most of the time she could be left to die, but sometimes keeping her alive is worth it to stack your hand or mess with terrain ignoring crews. Her Chronicle cycles a card, which is an amazing free effect. It can be combined in funny ways with Austera's or Tannenbaum's Chronicles to manipulate the card you draw, but really it's just good enough on its own. This is part of the reason I say Jedza wants to lost knowledge at least once per turn, since every card is valuable fuel for Sophie's card cycling and Seeker's discard effects. Her most important action is Camp by Candlelight. It's only once per turn, but the built-in ram gives Jedza a free life token for 2 damage. 
At worst, think of this as Sophie banking two of her own life for later. There's almost no reason not to use this, even if you don't want Sophie taking damage. In fact, she doesn't even have to take the damage. If Sophie heals within the bubble before using the trigger, Jed's Chronicle will reduce it to zero. The actual effect of the action removes conditions, but it sucks for the worst ones like stunned, slow, staggered, and distracted since it's at the end of the activation. For the rest, it's not bad, although discarding a card is painful when they can be cycled into a better one. The mask trigger is not built in and costs you the extra life token, but it can very rarely screw your opponent completely. Incorporeal, unimpeded, and similar terrain ignoring models can often position themselves near terrain in ways where suddenly having that ability removed leaves them stranded. It similarly removes immunity to hazardous terrain, which is very good in Seeker. Grab from the pack is simple and excellent. On first turn this helps load up the damned, and later on Sophie just uses it on whoever she can. Trampling Hooves is an above average attack with a bad stat. Sophie doesn't want to be in danger, so it won't get used often. The Mask Trigger is awkward for the same reason. Move Along Helping Seeker's low walk values is a nice perk, and Companion lets Sophie activate without eating a real activation at the top of turn, useful for setting up Bell of the Vagrant or generating a focused and life token before she dies. Overall, Sophie is good. At worst, she'll provide some first turn movement help, give out one or two focus, give Jedza a couple life tokens, and requires attention to be killed on turn two. At best, she's left undisturbed, and you cycle weak cards away all game. Keyword choices Mikhail the 16th, 9 cost henchman. Mikhail is a hybrid beater protector with an incredibly high ceiling for potential if his mechanics are mastered. Let's start with his one big weakness. He is very expensive and doesn't have an active bonus action, so his abilities and actions have to pull a lot of weight. I more or less treat models as having 3 AP, and those without a good bonus action are effectively slow every activation in my eyes. Don't get me wrong, Shrug Off is fine, but without a second bonus action, it's almost identical to the model having, at the start of your activation, end one condition on this model, and no bonus action at all. Jedza and Sophie already have condition removal too, making Shrug Off much worse in keyword. To make up for this, Mikhail's Chronicle Protection lets him place into base contact with the healed model, so he never has to walk. This is one of the best movement abilities in the game and has an especially high potential if activation order and positioning is well managed. Ideally, Mikhail should be teleporting multiple times per turn and precisely applying his 2 inch engagement range to obliterate the opponent's actions. Mikhail especially doesn't want to walk because My Father's Legacy lets him generate focused with both AP. It's also an irresistible movement effect for enemies engaging his target, useful in Seeker for all the usual small push effect reasons. The Mask Trigger gives Mikhail a free melee attack, although without triggers. It's a good thing Mikhail has one of the best attacks in the game, Kosche. Minimum 3 in Explorers is already scarce, and on top of that Mikhail gets to heal something for one. This as always triggers chronicle effects, or can deal damage inside the bubble of life for an effective minimum 4. Sweeping Strike with min 3 damage is stupid when the positioning is good for it, and In Memoriam lets Mikhail rig his deck. The card is chosen at the time you declare the trigger, so you can't choose the card currently being used in the duel. If Mikhail has an action left, he wants a severe crow or tome to attack with, or a moderate mask for My Father's Legacy. Otherwise, just choose the highest card available for defense when the opponent activates. Entomb is a 2 in Shockwave which gives out Stunned, the strongest condition in the game. The move target number may rarely hit upwards of 15 when there's schemes, corpses, and scrap markers lying around. Mikhail is absurdly hard to take down with his 6 5 defenses, 9 health, armor 1, hard to kill, and healing. Unyielding cuts down on the amount of actions that can move Mikhail and ensures that his attacks can't be turned against his own crew. Hard to kill in particular makes Mikhail functionally immortal within Jedza's bubble, since life tokens heal too. It might actually be easier to kill Jedza from full health than it is to finish off a 2 health Mikhail in the bubble, depending on how many life tokens are left. Don't get too cocky though, Mikhail is size 2 on a 30mm base, making it pretty easy to break his line of sight to Jedza unless he's in base contact. Last but not least, Caught in the Ring is an amazing ability, preventing enemies Mikhail engages from attacking anyone but him. This includes ranged attacks and beneficial attack actions targeted at allies like Obey, and is the main reason for Mikhail to teleport and apply his melee range to enemies even when he's already activated. Final Verdict? 
In keyword, four stars. Mikhail is an absolute unit, but he's also expensive in a keyword which strengthens cheaper models. I don't think you can go wrong by taking him, but consider that a surveyor carrying an upgrade is still one less cost than Mikhail. He's going to be invaluable in many scenarios, but other times I expect he could be overkill when the damned, grave goo, or a surveyor could do disruption or damage either for a cheaper cost or in a better way in that specific matchup. Out of keyword, three stars. Mikhail needs to be supported with a decent amount of healing to move him around, but his min damage 3, tankiness, and protection capability is highly desirable in many crews for 10 stones. The Damned, 8 cost enforcer. One day Jedza tried to kill the Blessed of December by overdosing it on cocaine, but its corpse now runs on the stuff and follows her around. At least, that's what the rules seem to indicate, I don't know, I don't read the fluff much. Average stats with 9 health and hard to wound is great. Even after 2 old ways damage, he survives min 3 damage twice without healing. His chronicle is the most offensive one, and I would say the best. It deals damage with no resist when your crew heals, and creates a positioning restriction if the enemy wants to heal. Despite all the 2 inch engagement ranges, seeker models won't always be able to stay over an inch away, so this pulse is welcome. If a friendly model gets surrounded for a while, this can even be one of the best sources of damage in the whole crew. As far as contributing his own healing, the damned only has toss away the scraps. Nothing really to complain about here, it's just a much better eat your fill. It might activate once or twice per game on average, and occasionally the damned just goes on a feeding frenzy against a crew like Big Hat. Moving on to attacks, Ferocious Claws has the focus hungry but powerful 246 damage track, as well as a small push effect. Both Critical Strike and Pouncing Strike are excellent triggers for increasing damage output, making this attack far above average despite suffering somewhat from hard to wound. Consider Breath of Fire with Focused was already one of the most dangerous attacks in the game. Breath of Frost has the same damage track but replaces the burning with Staggered, a much stronger condition with better synergy opportunities. It's only stat 5, so try targeting low defense models and gun for that severe damage. Attacking normally for minimum 2 and Staggered is not bad either. The built-in trigger places Ice Pillars instead of Blasts, which can be useful as roadblocks or for Jedza to Life of the Earth. Leap on a 6 is the perfect bonus action to close out this kit, giving the damned the most freedom of mobility out of all Seeker models. This lets him hunt on the flanks, scheme, or escape into Jedza's bubble once he's taken too much damage. Lastly, the old ways damages the dam to recycle good cards or ensure his leap is unfailable. When using this ability, his melee attack can't be focused, but Breath of Frost can if attacking through concealment. Flipping from the discard pile synergizes perfectly with the dam's focus-hungry nature, because cheating a severe for damage also leaves it ready to be reused on his second attack. Final verdict? In keyword, 5 stars. This is my first auto-take-in seeker every time. The Damned is a threatening combat or scheming piece with great synergies to exploit, and unlike other seeker options, his excellent mobility isn't dependent on other models. He can find a role in any objective pool and can operate well anywhere on the table. Out of keyword, 4 stars. The Damned is effective outside of seeker in exactly the same way. His kit synergizes well with movement duels, injured, healing, generating focused, and more effects which are common in explorers. His chronicle can be a soft counter to enemy healing, and for some keywords he fills the gap of much needed damage output. Tannenbaum, 8 cost enforcer. This is just a quick note on Tannenbaum, who was covered in the versatile video. Tannenbaum in Seeker isn't needed, since Jedza already has marker removal covered. His scheme marker creation and chronicle are just a worse version of Austera's too. Notably, he can push terrain markers to cause hazardous damage or for Jedza to pulse off of. Final verdict, in keyword, 2 stars. He's not bad, but generally Jedza, Sophie, and Ostera do everything he covers already, making him overkill. Ostera and Twitch, 7 cost enforcer. Ostera is a durable scheme dropper who generates card advantage and has an awesome ranged attack. Her average stats and 7 hard to wound health is in a good spot, especially for a model who can hide most of the game. Eyes in the Sky enables her scheming. It requires a fairly high 9, but lets her drop a scheme anywhere in a massive area while staying completely safe, or up to 20 inches away from where she activates with a double walk. The mask trigger even allows her to drop 3 scheme markers in a single activation, which is very rare. 
Her other bonus action, Aerial Strike, ignores every targeting penalty at stat 6 with 5 severe damage, perfect for assassinating support totems and models in one-shot range with no chance to hide. She doesn't even need to hold a focus since she can walk, concentrate, and still attack in a single activation. Puncture lets her cheat damage against hard-to-wound models, and Vantage Point is a longer range alternative to Eyes in the Sky that requires winning a duel rather than a 9. Austera's secondary purpose is generating card advantage. Nature's Rejuvenation is almost exactly like using a soul stone for card cycling, so by using an action, Austera saves you a stone or makes up for bad luck. Chronicle Survival at first may seem like occasionally discarding low cards from your deck and high cards from the opposing deck, but it's actually way better. It also lets you know which card will be flipped on the next duel and optimally plan your action and triggers around that. For example, Mikhail attacks and heals himself with his first AP. Austera sees his next card as a Six of Crows, so she decides to discard it and hopes he'll flip something better. But if instead of Crows the cards was a Six of Masks, Mikhail can use My Father's Legacy with the trigger, move some enemies, and then attack with a free focus. But instead again if the card was the Thirteen of Masks rather than the Six, he wouldn't waste that on My Father's Legacy, he would attack knowing he can't fail, and might even use a Soul Stone for a Tome. Having the ability to tailor your next move like this on a Chronicle that triggers for free is subtle but insanely strong, sometimes as good as drawing a card. Now to close up with her more miscellaneous aspects. Sharp Claws is a pretty basic melee attack, but if Ostera has nothing better to do after scheming, it's not the worst idea to charge her in. She's fast and durable enough to survive a little damage. Siphon Life is an amazing trigger and only gets better with Chronicles. Rake the Eyes can set up an Aerial Strike or Eyes in the Sky depending on who she attacks, but it's random and you might help the opponent by showing him what cards are coming up. Herald along with 6 unimpeded movement lets Austera get across the center line with a single walk in most deployments, or can help her quickly move to the flanks where she can scheme unopposed. As for Scout Ahead, I can see it being useful if the opponent has a single obvious scheme runner to see which flank he gets deployed on. It also seems like it could help in flank deployment by choosing a slow beat stick and seeing which one of the prongs the opponent commits to. Final verdict? In keyword, 3 stars. But you praised her so much, I hear you say. It's true that Austera is powerful, but unfortunately a lot of what she does is already covered in Seeker. Jedza can drop scheme markers within 4 inches of one another, Sophie already cycles cards in hand, and the Damned is capable of dropping some schemes on the flanks. I think she's only needed if both your schemes are scheme marker based. She's still good, but where she really shines is out of keyword. 4 stars. Card cycling, dropping scheme markers with precision, her chronicle, and everything else Austera brings are highly desired in other keywords for schemes like spread them out. She can also be a good counter pick if aerial strike can pick off a specific model you need dead. Grave Goo. 7 cost enforcer. The first thing of note is that Grave Goo is ridiculously hard to put down. It starts with a good base of 8 health and hard to wound with passable stats, and then adds on Regeneration 2, Grim Feast, and Through the Muck. Altogether, Goo can heal up to 6 health and gain multiple shielded in a single activation, basically taking him from almost dead to full strength. Most of the time this will be 2 health and 2 shielded, but that's already 4 effective health it generates for itself just by activating. Slippery adds on more defense, making him harder to attack and sometimes being as good as Don't Mind Me for scheming. And Trail of Slime lets Goo safely hide from melee and terrain. This makes hiring it best on forest boards rather than ones with more impassable or blocking terrain. The Hazardous even adds poison to the normal damage, making it slightly better than regular Hazardous effects. In the right circumstances, you can practically consider Grave Goo immune to melee and only worth attacking at range. Grave Goo's primary tactic is to swallow an enemy and scurry off into terrain. Engulf is stat 5 against move, but with a walk charge through terrain and the trigger, it's effectively stat 7. Moving Goo before it activates or attacking a staggered enemy can help even more, pretty much making it impossible to fail. If that trigger isn't necessary, the other one deals one irreducible damage instead. When he succeeds, the target gets buried and stays buried if it can't pass a TN14 move duel when it activates, wasting all of its actions. To point out how strong this is, if Goo swallows a staggered model with average 5 move, it requires a severe to escape. Alternatively, other enemies gain a trigger to pull their ally out when melee attacking. That's why Goo wants to get into a forest or similar terrain piece as soon as possible, 
The severe and hazardous makes the rescue mission that much harder, and traps the swallowed model even if it manages to unbury. Instead of swallowing an enemy and scurrying back to terrain, Goo can also damage enemies by touching terrain that they're already standing in. Even if the enemy immediately moves out, it still takes effectively 2 damage from one hazardous tick. Chronicle Leech is probably the worst Chronicle, but with everything Grave Goo can do, who cares? Poison stacking is bad, but Goo can actually do enough of it to result in some extra damage, and between this and Trail of Slime, it's free. Finally, Sludge Strike is pretty good. Its damage track is bad except for the Fantastic Severe, and extra poison from Infect will rarely make a difference. It's mainly for trying to hit that Severe 6, or getting the Mask Trigger. Accidental Rollover deals great damage if Goo can push over multiple enemies, and is a separate instance of movement for plus one shielded. It can mess up Engulf after charging though, since you can't control the push distance and remain in base contact with what you charged. With a swallowed enemy, Goo can charge and attack it instead of walking too. If Rollover is triggered, Goo can even get 10 inches of movement out of just one action anywhere on the board. Final verdict? In keyword, 4 stars. However, as long as the board has well-placed forests, fog banks, and rivers that Grave Goo can exploit, the rating is 5 stars. Otherwise, it's closer to 3. If Goo is used well, it's tankier than most models in the game, its damage is great, and it's basically a don't mind me model with the way it ignores engagement and can bury anything in its way. Goo is another seeker who is happy to operate outside the bubble, and the ability to remove models from the board so easily can be anywhere from useful to outright game winning. Out of keyword, 3 stars. Grave Goo works the same out of keyword, just for an extra stone. The only synergies at once are staggered enemies and sometimes movement help, both of which are common in explorer society. Lamplighter. 7 cost minion. Lamplighters are Seeker's support models. They also require a fairly long analysis, and for the sake of my sanity, I'm going to avoid tongue twisting Lamplighter, Lit Lamp, and Lamp Marker back to back by calling this little guy Bob. Let's start with the Lamp Marker mechanic. Bob comes with two concealing lamps and can create more in base contact with himself using a trigger. Lamps are not destructible, which can be a huge plus. When Bob gets close to a lamp, he can bonus action light the way to make the marker lit and provide a 2 inch aura of plus flips once per activation for each friendly model. By the rules, I believe if a model is affected by two of these auras, it can't get a double plus to one duel, but it can use the benefit on two separate duels within the same activation. The aura usually gives a good boost to a few actions each turn, but it really shines when enemies attack over the course of multiple activations, or when benefiting a model who can attack out of its activation. It applies to simple duels as well, so it helps support actions and even works as a defensive option against pulses and shockwaves. The problem is that the bonus only applies to a very small area, which is even smaller if friendly models also want to benefit from the concealment. Lamps can only be moved by Tannenbaum or Light the Way's Mask Trigger, the latter also being the most efficient way for Bob to get around. Both of these pushes only move the marker 3 inches, so lamps are still restricted to the area where they're first placed for the most part. The other trigger is just a situational small push effect. Bob's other bonus action lets him interact near a lit lamp within 8 inches, but at the cost of lighting a new one, which is a big downside. In theory, this and Don't Mind Me would let him interact very freely, but in order to have a lit lamp, Bob has to have already been in that area previously. He isn't good at moving around, and even if he does, most lamps left behind are probably in defensive positions, not in scoring zones, so this action is very niche. In the right circumstances, the Crow Trigger could deny a point in strategies like Recover Evidence or Symbols of Authority. Also niche, but maybe useful. Defensively, Bob isn't great. He's got average stats and no damage reduction abilities, but at least he's likely getting plus to defense, and 7 health is barely enough not to get one shot. In keyword, Jedza can keep him alive too. Shimmering Lights would be an insanely strong ability had it been on a frontline tank model. Enemies who charge into Bob's 2 inch engagement get distracted applied before they swing, and it can proactively apply distracted with push effects. It can be good, but the counter to basically all of these defenses is just 1 or 2 focused and forcing attacks through. During his activation, Bob mainly heals and pushes. Unnatural Glow does both and is the action he'll use most. It only requires a 5, meaning near a lit lamp it has a 90% chance to succeed on its own. It can also target enemies for some decent effects in the bubble. It's usually better on allies so Bob can easily get the Tome trigger. 
Bob basically doesn't have a bonus action without a dim lamp nearby, and misses a lot of future value from plus flips in the same way a summoner missing their summon loses out. This can be avoided by placing his initial two markers close to each other, but that also tells the opponent exactly where Bob is headed. Finally, Lighting Stick is a decent attack. 2 inch engagement and effectively 2 4 4 damage if you include the delayed burning is pretty good. The mask triggers a small push effect with a restricted direction. Final verdict? In keyword 2 stars and out of keyword 2 stars. I think in any other faction, Lamplighters could easily be 4 star models for their don't mind me, healing, pushes, plus flips, concealment, and so on. Especially if research mission stays in gaining grounds too. Unfortunately, Explorer Society already has many options for terrain markers, concealment, healing, movement, unimpeded, and don't mind me, or at least pseudo don't mind me, and that's almost that whole list. The lamp marker mechanic feels too dependent on Light the Way's mask trigger to enable anything more than standing in one spot and building a haven of plus flips and concealment. It feels to me like Chronicle Seclusion should have pushed the lamplighter towards a lamp marker instead of its current effect. That would fit the theme of wandering healers who light lamps and benefit allies before moving to the next lamp much better. It even sounds like it, Chronicle Seclusion, they walk secluded by themselves. The addition of that kind of movement would have easily made them 3 stars, but I digress. At 7 or 8 cost, Bob isn't a choice they can squeeze in without having to replace another substantial option. This applies in Seeker about as much as it does in other keywords. He could be useful when your most important models want to stay in a specific area and expect to take heavy ranged fire. Surveyor. 6 cost minion. So when I first looked at surveyors, I thought they were strong but not resilient enough after a couple price of progress uses, and ultimately a mid-cost combat minion doesn't seem needed in a crew with already resilient henchmen and enforcer options. Those initial thoughts were actually exactly backwards. Jedza and Seeker grant all the synergies needed to patch up the Surveyor's weaknesses and makes them a consideration before all of the fancy options. Surveyors follow the pattern of barely passable defensive stats, this time with 6 wounds and armor 1. It's a solid base for a 6 cost minion, but price of progress damage is a problem. Thankfully, life tokens protect the Surveyor from being killed prematurely and when he heals, Jedza's Chronicle gives him a free price of progress during that activation. So why do we want to spend life tokens on a 6 cost minion? Well first because Field of Steel is an area of controllability good enough to be on a master, just ask Yan Lo. This is the best source of hazardous available to Seeker and generates crazy damage when comboed with their push effects and engagement ranges. Secondly, Chronicle Geomancy provides additional area control by blocking corridors or charge lanes, and gives Jedza 4 damage Life of the Earth pulses with flexible placement. The geodes are destructible, but the 2 inch range will usually allow the marker to be placed between 1 and 2 inches from all enemies. This makes them both dangerous and a pain to remove. Having to discard a card is bad when Sophie could cycle it though. Don't expect to be dropping handfuls of geodes each turn, but 2 well placed geodes isn't unreasonable. Thirdly, the Surveyor comes with great attacks, starting with his 2 inch melee. Against single targets it only deals 2-2-3 damage, but the Mass Hysteria trigger pushes damaged models through his own Hazardous, making it effectively 3-3-4 and exploiting the Surveyor's 2 inch melee to full effect. Against a clump of enemies, either trigger and the blasts already built into the action can combine for different effects depending on the situation. It's definitely not hard for moderate damage to deal 6 or maybe even more. Hooked Chain is a gun action which can similarly pull an enemy into engagement for an effective 3-4-5 damage flip with no suit required. It can on your heels trigger, probably to engage and deal hazardous to several other enemies. This likely leaves Jedza's bubble though, so be careful not to overextend. Pythagorean Quake can potentially affect a massive area and push models into hazardous for 2 total damage, probably more when they activate. Geode markers will be on the board, and Jedza drops ski markers for free with her bonus action, so depending on who you target, this could easily hit several enemies. Remember that Price of Progress makes all those different triggers cheap and reliable, unlike for example most models with On Your Heels which have to spend soul stones or have a high mask in hand to win the duel. As a last note, the Surveyor has slow movement, but once he's engaged that doesn't matter anymore. Chain Gang even lets him help friendly models with movement while he moves himself. Final verdict? In keyword, 5 stars. Always take a Surveyor. His area control, flexibility, and potentially massive damage output is unmatched for the price. As a hard to remove minion, he also makes an amazing upgrade carrier. 
I'd consider a second one, but taking two could have you miss other options, and even if you take two, you still have the same number of life tokens and cards to discard. Out of keyword, one star. At seven cost with less synergy and without Jedza's immortality, the Surveyor can be effective but too easily killed. I think other crews have better options. More Wraith, four cost minion. More Wraith's defensive stats are terrible, they're slow, they rely too much on terrain, they're within one shot range if they don't have shielded, and they're not important enough to spend life tokens on when those tokens can save much better models later. Although if they're able to stack some shielded, they're fairly resilient to throwaway attacks, I'll give them that. Their chronicle lets them move towards the healed model, but only two inches. If Jedza moves with any level of urgency, the Wraith is quickly left behind. In theory, they stack shielded with chronicle and then activate to hard slam for 3, 4, 6 damage, but the stat is bad, the shielded is removed and leaves them vulnerable even if they miss, and to get min 3 damage with 2 attacks, you need 4 whole shielded. They might be able to pull it off once, but they'll either die or become fairly useless immediately after, since they're no longer in terrain. Dirt Nap only heals 1 at the cost of slow. The trouble isn't worth it on friendlies. Against enemies, it's actually good, especially within the bubble. But in the bubble is probably where Seeker is most geared to absorbing damage, making slow the least useful in that area. Final Rest just sucks, and Rolling Stones is generally a worse version of Surveyor's Field of Steel and Chronicle. Final Verdict, 1 star, 1 star. Moraiths are too expensive, too slow, and don't meaningfully contribute to any strategy or scheme. They try to be an investment into future life tokens, which throw out slow effects and maybe some high damage once, but if Jedza wants to be aggressive, they don't fit that playstyle, and if Jedza is defensive, hopeful prospects make better life tokens with their 14-inch gun, hard to kill, and potential to become surveyors. Out of keyword choices. As always, remember this is just a few mentions which have interesting synergies and can't be an exhaustive list. The most obvious mention, and pretty much always the first, is Intrepid Effigy and Emissary, more so the Emissary. Just by being able to heal models out of activation when enemies attack them and activate Jedza's Chronicle, Emissary is an immediate auto-take, no questions asked whatsoever. Archivist is great as well. His Ill Omens bonus is really good for activating effects at the top of turn, especially Emissary's Healing Aura and Surveyor's Field of Steel. His web markers aren't the best target for Life of the Earth, but they're something, and Siphon Power can damage your own models so that they then heal and activate Chronicle effects. Next we have Hopeful Prospects, another one of my favorites. They're really cheap, they have hard to kill and always heal from Jedza's aura, and if they get lucky enough to transform, Surveyors are one of the best minions available for that. They do run the risk of being completely ignored though, and their card cycling isn't optional, so if Sophie stacks your hand, they can then screw with that and discard a high card. Crypsis Core can be pretty insane, because Geodes give them a hazardous aura. All of Seeker's pushes can also trigger the strike lines, and if you take a lamp lighter, he can attack out of activation and continually get that plus from the lit lamp marker. Next we have Winston Finnegan, he's already a great model, and he can heal out of activation if an enemy fails a duel against him, which works well with Jedza's Chronicle. Also just like Surveyor's, he can ignore a price of progress damage if he heals before he uses it. And last but not least, we have the Botanist. The Botanist has a lot of healing both in and out of activation, and Geode markers make it easy enough to load him up at the beginning. Counterplay when building your crew, go Elite and Mobile. Models which are cheap, squishy, and unable to move away from Jedza are easy life tokens for her to collect. Less models and more mobility also make it easier to avoid being clumped near terrain pieces. If you do unfortunately declare Hamlin or Big Hat into Seeker, try your best to keep your cheap models away from the bubble and spread out. Don't rely on heal effects and definitely don't take options with involuntary healing like regeneration and most obviously take anti-healing effects if they're available on good models. Push effects can also net kills by getting models out of aura range, or blocking line of sight to Jedza is the last option. For surveyors, you'll need at least a 40mm base, and for damned or goo, you'll need size 3 to block the bubble. In melee, remember if a life token is used, Jedza's Chronicle will prevent your next instance of damage, so only kill with your last action, have something else to do, or have a way to pop the effect before attacking again. If you can kill Jedza, do it, but don't plan on being able to. 
It'll require at least two back-to-back -back activations from a min 3 damage beater with flurry or a similar effect, and even then Jedza can be protected by Emissary or Mikhail. Speaking of which, min damage 3 is essential. Seeker has a ton of hard to wound models, and life tokens heal 2, plus 1 more if the model activates, for 3 health total. Lastly, with the exception of Jedza who you probably won't kill anyway, nearly all the strong Seeker models have less willpower than defense. Movement values are fairly low across the board too, so targeting non-defense is probably a good bet. And with that, Seeker's done. As always, here's a summary of the ratings, thanks to everyone for watching, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Hang up. Corporate needs you to find the differences between this picture and this picture. Intel has told us there are at least seven. Okay, I already see one. Give them. Okay. They're the same picture.